My name is Mark Gold. Um, I'm Associate Vice Chancellor for Environment and Sustainability here at UCLA. Um, welcome to the water panel. Uh, uh, to put water in context, obviously it's been such an enormous issue for the state of California um, within, the last, uh, within the last 30, 40 years actually, but um, definitely has been magnified quite a bit um, because of the uh, record drought that we've had the last um, five years, uh, which is remaining definitely here in Southern California with us only having seven inches of rain here in Los Angeles County. Um, we're lucky that we have some of the uh, leading experts um, on water uh, that you can find anywhere. Um, and I, I think uh, the fact that we have um, leadership from uh, Yuri Shamir, who's going to, going to speak first, to talk about, um, about uh, obviously the incredible success story that has occurred um, within Israel on self-sufficiency um, for water supply and uh, being leaders on conservation and water recycling in particular. Um, and obviously they've just embraced in a huge way ocean desalination um, is, is, is a big change for that nation as well. Here at home in California, um, it's taken this drought uh, to really magnify the issue that our, uh, how we've been relying on water supplies here in Southern California um, is just not sustainable. Uh, you look at the city of Los Angeles and roughly 89% of water supply during this drought has been imported by more than 250 miles away. Um, and uh, you see LA County as a whole, it's around 60%. There's greater reliance on groundwater um, in the San Gabriel Valley is, is a particular example there. Um, so as such, we've seen for the first time um, mandatory uh, rollbacks in urban conservation, uh, which sort of creeped the other direction a couple of days ago, unfortunately. Um, and then uh, we're, there's really been a big push on moving more towards local self-sufficiency, looking at our local water supplies, um, be it from water recycling, from stormwater capture and infiltration, um, getting more out of our groundwater, um, and then continuing um, what has already been, especially within the LA region, pretty, uh, very successful conservation over the decades. So with that, that's the context. You've heard a little bit um, in the opening remarks from uh, Professor Stephanie Pincel about the Sustainable LA Grand Challenge. And, and one, of, uh, one of the parts of the Grand Challenge is uh, getting LA County to 100% local water um, and the research necessary to make it done, make it actually happen. Um, is it feasible? Um, there's a lot of faculty here and students here on campus who are looking at this issue. Um, so that's the context in which this panel is going to be discussing urban um, water sustainability. And we're very, very fortunate that uh, Professor uh, Yuri Shamir um, has come out from Israel. He's a professor emeritus civil and environmental engineering at the Technion um, in Israel Institute of Technology. Um, very big picture thinker um, as an engineer, uh, uses hy his hydrology background um, to really help in shaping um, his recommendations on water management. Um, and he's focused uh, particularly on urban water management, not only at the local scale, but at the nation scale and at the international scale. So please welcome him. Uh, water is uh, owned by the state and therefore we have a way of regulating everything. It's not to say that we are successful in everything, but uh, it's definitely a very different situation from the legal situation in the US. While the title of the meeting is smart and sustainable, I'd like to talk about sustainable and then get to smart if I have the time. And sustainable, in my opinion, starts with integrating planning and management with all other relevant urban and regional plans and functions. So it's not a standalone. Water sensitive planning means to include water and wastewater and runoff aspects into spatial and functional urban and regional planning from the very beginning, from the outset, rather than having first the development and then telling the water engineers or the sewerage engineers to do their piece. Sustainable needs effective and efficient use of the water resources, effective and efficient water conveyance and distribution system, 
effective governance of the urban water sector, financial stability and resiliency, no less, professional capacity within the organization, blended with social equity and with public participation. On the technical side, that was a general, on the technical side, because water comes from far away, relatively speaking, and I'll show you the examples for three cities from Los Angeles, for Jerusalem, and for Amman, Jordan, water usually comes from far away. It's a regional matter. It's not a local city matter at all. In most cases, and I've worked uh, throughout the United States in many places and in other countries, it's usually a regional connection. There's a requirement for re infrastructure resiliency, and our infrastructure is becoming older and older in the states. We're facing, the states are facing a huge budget uh, resulting from the need to renovate. There is a need to reduce the unaccounted for, sometimes called leakage, but it's actually the difference between what is produced and what is sold. Efficient operation for energy and energy cost reduction, real-time meter reading and monitoring, and monitoring. Online models, we need models and we use them extensively, not only in Israel, but here too. On the water supply system, water security, in normal and in emergent, normal times and emergencies. Management of the sewerage and effluent system, stormwater runoff management for multiple objectives and use of potable and sub-potable waters together, rainfall, runoff, gray, treated, and wastewater. But we deal with a range of cities, and while we're sitting in Los Angeles and we're talking about relatively large cities and on the developed world, let us not forget that our cities many of them in the less developed countries, and they are ill-equipped to deal with the kind of stuff we're talking about here, definitely about the smart, leave alone the sustainable. Small cities below 10,000, medium size, say 100,000 as an example, large and mega cities about one mi above 1 million. But there are also new cities and sections within the existing cities that we need to deal with in this respect. Take three examples. Los Angeles itself is about 4 million supplied, and it's claimed to be LAWWP, is reputed to be the largest uh, utility in the country. Jerusalem is 800,000, Amman has 4 million, Amman itself. And while uh, Jerusalem is only 9% of the Israeli population, Amman is 42%. So, and I'll show you a map about that. But look at the bottom now. In the US, there are 156,000 public water systems, and 97% of them provide water to less than 10,000 people. Think about all those cities out there who are not of a capacity of the large cities. And when you say a public water supply system, it goes all the way down to 25 people being supplied. But they're obviously larger ones. And these smaller systems have issues of managerial, technical, and financial capacity. Look at Jerusalem, just a map. The ancient Jerusalem was supplied from about 20 kilometers away outside the city by gravity, 950 BC, to the southwest. Very fancy. Today, Jerusalem has five lines coming in from the west, from the lower part of the country. And it's all pumped uphill about 800 meters to get to Jerusalem and then stored in large reservoirs that I won't show you. The first line was laid by the British during the mandate in 1936. Then there was a siege of Jerusalem in 1948 during the War of Independence, and people were standing in line with pails to get water. And during the war, a second line was being laid under tremendous pressure in a very short time from the same sources as before in the coastal area or in the mountain uh, bottom. Uh, all the way to the top within a very short period of time. Today, a fifth line is already under construction. All of these in parallel to meet the demands in Jerusalem, which has very little local water. In ancient times, we used to have cisterns and collect the water there. That's no longer a real option. But look at the demand side of the picture. I was talking about what we're doing to supply, for example, Jerusalem. This is the demand in the country, the Red line at the top is the total demand in meters, cubic meters per capita per individual per year. 
And you can see the declining line, and in particular, this one in agriculture. Look what is happening here. The total amount of water being used in agriculture per capita has been reduced by a factor of about seven in the last six, seven decades. And that's one of the major issues that I think California is facing. Where, which sectors are using the water, and what are the laws and regulations that allow the state or the governing bodies to change the overall picture between the different sectors. While the urban may look to you to be flat at the bottom, actually it is not. But in order to respond to the overall need for water, I'll go back to the supply and talk about the desalination plants. In the last decade, from 2006, three major plants were being built in 2006, 8, and 10 to supply a total of about 300 and 37 after they had also been expanded, and that makes 30% of the total annual replenishment of water in the country, 1,200 million cubic meters. An additional plant came on in 2014, the largest one in Sorek. Another one in Ashdod is coming online right now. The total is 587 million cubic meters a year, and look at the number at the top, which says 1,200 natural average available, so it's about half of the total, and it's about 70% of the urban consumption. That's not to say that this all goes directly to the urban areas. No, not at all. It's being blended into the national water system and supplied jointly for all of the sectors, and now we are basically providing a blend of desalinated and natural waters, which also come in different qualities. We also offered the Palestinians to locate, during the talks in the early 1990s, to locate a desalination plant on the Israeli coast to provide water to the West Bank that was not materialized because of the political differences. But look at Jordan. Amman and Zarqa in the middle are the only large areas within Jordan. The rest of it is not populated almost completely. Amman and Jordan get, and, and uh, Zarqa get their water partly from the Jordan Rift, from the King Abdullah Canal, which provides water also that is transferred from Israel according to the agreements, the 1994 peace treaty includes in it a transfer, and now more water is being provided than was in the original plan. So Amman gets its water low, top left from the Sea of Galilee through the Israeli system, from local reservoirs middle, and from trucks throughout the city because Amman has water only part of the days during the week. A new construction is underway from a distance of 325 kilometers to the south on the Saudi border from the DC <coughs> groundwater aquifer, which is a fossil aquifer, which means it's being will it be depleted, there will be no more water in there, but it's going to be useful for 50 or more years. And the very large pipeline is under construction. Los Angeles County, the water district, three sources imported from the state water project in the north, from the Colorado River aqueduct in the east, distances of hundreds of kilometers and more, and the local groundwater that Mark was telling us is increasingly being used at this point in time, but again hitting some regulatory and legal issues about ownership of the water. In Israel, water is owned by the state. In the United States, depending on what part of the country you are in, there are other laws that govern and make very difficult the control. And the county encounters some major difficulties associated with a drought, with the Colorado River compact, agriculture versus cities, environmental issues, the Endangered Species Act, which intervenes once in a while in a major way, like in the Klamath River, just north on the border with Oregon. This is what the system looks like. It's usually largely long range distance transfers of water. So Los Angeles does depend on what happens in the region and a very large region at that. This is last week's drought monitor. The darker the color, the worse the situation. This is from the, sixth, the 10th of May, so it's very recent. And uh, the dark brown says uh, extreme droughts at this point in time. It's been going on now for several years. So let's look now at the urban water consumption and try to compare a bit. Let's look first at Israel. That's the curve that we had before, but now it's spread out. 
Let's look only at the red curve at the top. That's the total urban consumption made up from homes and gardens and then public buildings and so on. And it's the total at the top that is important. And you can see that in the last decade, there has been a rather substantial drop in the per capita consumption. We were also too late to go at that, in spite of the fact that we, are un we were under stress. And now if we look in more detail at this urban consumption, you can see that in the first phase there was a substantial increase in the per capita consumption until the 1990s. And then action was taken, and the net result is what we see today. There's about a 15% drop in the per capita consumption of water in the urban area. And if you look at that, and that's 15 cubic meters per capita at 14 million people in the year 20. 50, that amounts to two large desalination plants. So there's a lot to be done on the demand side, and not only at the supply side, which we as engineers have been accustomed to do. Build it, operate it, and get the water where it's needed. A balanced management needs to take very carefully at the demand side. Look at the per capita consumption in liters per day per capita. The top is in the United States, about 380 liters per day. At the bottom is Israel at 135, about 35% of the states. Let me tell you, standard of living does not suffer. Let's let, look at five US cities, LA, Phoenix, Boston, Milwaukee, and Santa Fe. And I will concentrate on Santa Fe in a minute because it's done wonders. You can see in the green is the available uh, water. OK, that's the capacity. And then in the darker colors on the left-hand side is the amount being paid by the consumers on a per capita basis, on a per family, and so on. Look what Santa Fe has been doing. It has the same amount of green uh, as the low, country, uh, the low cities, Boston and Milwaukee. And it uses per capita much less. And this is what has happened in the last 14 years in Santa Fe a reduction of 33% in the per capita consumption due to ex action by the city. We are, now we move from sustainable to smart. Well, if you look at Wikipedia and you find out what is a smart city, it turns out to be com completely ICT oriented. It says, put ICT everywhere in the city and combine libraries with water, with electricity, with everything else. <laughs> And to me, that is much too narrow. Is this what uh, the definition of smart is? No, not for me. That's not what I like. But if you take a look, for example, at the big business dictionary, you find out that the developed urban area that creates sustainable economic development and high quality of life by excelling in multiple areas, economy, mobility, environment, people, living, and government. How do you do that? Well, excelling in these key areas can be done through strong human capital, social capital, and or ICT infrastructure. I've been working for the last five decades in many cities in North America, Boston, Seattle, in Calgary, in Canada, in Edmonton, many other places. And I can tell you that this concentration on the ability of the system to move itself ahead with human capital and good management is key. And I find this to be a much better definition. ICT is a tool for smart management, not the management objective in itself. Are there smart water systems? Well, there are. And a smart city ICT is not merely a technical sensor and computer-based system. It's a platform for integrating functions and departments and people. And it can facilitate government of, and govern, sorry, improvement of governance. Uh, but it's not governance in itself. And smart cities have also some pitfalls. Number one, it's incompatible very frequently with the organizational structure of the city and its personnel. The dependence on ICT runs the risk that if it fails, there is no backup because you would begin to depend on ICT or you might run that kind of a risk. And furthermore, there is a strong tendency to collect a lot of data and not do enough analysis. There is a lot of information that is buried in there and there is a tendency to collect data and display it in lovely colors but not dig deep enough to understand two, two. Thank you. 
So Israel is a real leader in smart water technology, even to the point where we have now ultrasonic uh, water measuring devices, no uh, moving parts. And it's gone as far as saying that we have drones that are able, now don't laugh, we're doing remote sensing. Here is remote sensing for you. The drone flies over the city and collects the information from the meters being telemetered. There's an international group called SWAN, SWAN. These are smart water networks. It's an industry-based forum that tries to disseminate this information. I'll skip and go faster. And it works by doing exactly what you might think, combining sensors with transmission, with collection, and with analysis. What are the messages from what I said until now? Well, the sustainability messages are that sustainable water management at the city level and in general requires integration with other urban and regional systems. Water sensitive planning, as we call it, requires inclusion of water, wastewater, and runoff aspects into the early phases of spatial and functional plan and regional planning and not after the fact, which is frequently the case. It requires integration of professional disciplines, dedicated and capable personnel. Frequently, that is a major drawback. And using appropriate technologies, data collection, management, and analysis. The messages about smart, our technologies already exist and are advancing. Meter reading is an obvious area of ICT, but ICT system can and should do a lot more and should go beyond. Implementation requires an organizational perspective, not a technological one, an organizational perspective, and solid human resources basis. And I advise not to go for all and comprehensive and big in the ICT domain, but start with individual segments and then see whether or not there is benefit in merging them. And you should generate much more insight than mere data collection and include the use of models, which is a field that I'm deeply in. And there are some general messages that there are large, medium, and small cities. Don't forget those. Some of them are in developing countries. Have to consider smaller and weaker ones. Cities in developed and less developed countries, not all cities can and should have similar smart systems. Professional and human resources are key, and technology is available and advancing. And finally, with respect to this particular gathering. Can we learn from and with each other? Definitely, yes. Can we copy from others only with great caution? Thank you. Thank you for that excellent uh, overview, and it's uh, good to see what's been achieved in not only other parts of the world, but other parts of the country. Um, next up, uh, is Nancy Sutley. Uh, she's the Chief Sustainability and Economic Development Officer at LADWP. Um, prior to that, she was the former chair for President Obama's uh, Council on Environmental Quality. Um, she was a deputy mayor um, for Energy and the Environment under uh, previous mayor Antonio Villaraigosa. Um, she's been on the State Water Resources Control Board. She sat on the Metropolitan Water District Board. Um, all in all, she's, she really is one of the nation's leading policy experts on both climate and energy, as well as water. Nancy Sutley. Well, thanks, Mark, and uh, it's great to be here, and a uh, very interesting uh, opening on this panel, and uh, I think it's, uh, it's really um, great to have this opportunity to have this discussion. I think there's a lot that um, we can learn from each other and we can share, and Really, I think the, the lessons um, that Israel has learned and that we've learned here in California, I think, are um, important to try to highlight. And as, as you all know, and as uh, both uh, Mark and uh, pr uh, Professor Shamir mentioned, we are not out of the drought yet. Um, this is continuing, uh, particularly here in Southern California, and overall state statewide and in the Sierra, you know, it's we're roughly, uh, in Northern California, roughly around um, average. And average, uh, given a five-year drought, isn't particularly good enough. Um, and so we really have to plan today and act today um, as if this is our new normal, because um, it very well uh, can be um, may be likely to be, uh, especially in, in light of uh, in light of climate change, 
and in light of the sort of traditional way we viewed, viewed water um, here in California. So we have to really start to think differently uh, about water and water supplies and what does it mean uh, to be a smart city when it comes to, comes to water. Um, and as, as Professor Shamir said, you know, we have always relied on water imports and the work here at UCLA under the Grand Challenge is very interesting, very helpful, I think, as we look forward. Um, but at least in the sort of medium term in the kind of planning that we do at LADWP, we will continue to rely on imported water for some portion of our water supply. We just have to find ways to make it um, less uh, and, and less than the majority um, of our water. And that really requires a strategy that puts water conservation first and that thinks about how do we integrate um, other supplies, other types of local water resources um, into, into our water supply. And so that's really the, uh, what we're engaged in now, is trying to ensure that we're um, looking everywhere we can to try to achieve um, a very uh, much more, uh, as I said, balanced um, approach to water and, and water supply. And so uh, thinking about um, looking out 10, 20, 30 years into the future, that, that work to reduce our dependence on water that comes from hundreds, hundreds of miles away, water that we purchase from the Metropolitan Water District, even the water that we import that comes from uh, our own LA aqueduct system is the work that we're engaged in now. And the mayor has set a goal for Los Angeles to reduce its purchases of water by 50% by 2025, and to ensure that half of all of our water is sourced locally by 2035. So, so what does that mean? As I said, it means conservation first and foremost, expanding water recycling, enhancing our stormwater capture, and very importantly, taking advantage of the groundwater basin that we have in the San Fernando Valley, not just as a source of water, but as a way to help us to, to plan um, and, and manage uh, our water supply. And what that will require is um, a very extensive uh, cleanup uh, to deal with a, a legacy of industrial uh, contamination. So when it comes to water conservation, um, there's a lot of different elements to how do we make more progress on water conservation. One is really about education and about the public and getting the public engaged and, uh, and reminding people um, that we're still in a drought. Uh, and so the city has its uh, Save the Drop campaign. And many, of you, many of you, I hope, have seen the drop around. He's, he or she is pretty cute. Um, <laughs> I actually don't know what gender the drop is. Um, but this is not North Carolina, so we don't have to worry. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, um, moving right along. Uh, you know, so we've, we've done a, a, a pretty good job uh, here in Los Angeles and really across California of, of getting uh, to a to more... Um, in, to, to a better place when it comes to water conservation, certainly indoors, uh, certainly in our homes, in our buildings, in our office buildings, in our in college campuses. Uh, and you know, the statistic you may hear is that you know, basically water use peaked in Los Angeles and in the late 80s, and we're using the same amount of water we did then, and we've added more than a million people. The real opportunity um, to make dramatic uh, Increases in conservation is really in outdoor and the outdoor uh, water use, uh, and so for example, uh, one of the measures that was uh, way more successful and popular than we had anticipated was the uh, the, the um, turf replacement incentive, uh, where we supplemented uh, some uh, money that was put in by the Metropolitan Water District. We added to that, and uh, as a result, in a sort of 
a very short period of time, we replaced um, you know, literally millions of square feet of lawn in Los Angeles uh, with uh, more uh, California-friendly or drought-friendly landscaping. And it was so successful that um, it sort of ran out of money. Uh, but I think it, it points really to the, the long-term need to, to reduce, to continue to reduce our um, outdoor water use. And so um, our drought ordinance in the city of Los Angeles uh, remains in place and continue to pro prohibit certain types of water uses. Uh, uh, outdoors, uh, can't let water run off your, your um, property uh, and, and other things, uh, and added some uh, some uh, restrictions on um, excessive uh, excessive water use. So we're trying to put in place and institutionalize some of those um, kinds of conservation measures that are uh, aimed specifically at reducing outdoor water use. When it comes to uh, water recycling, we have goals uh, to get uh, about 60,000 acre feet of recycled water by 2035. Uh, and uh, right now there is some that's uh, used for outdoor irrigation. Many of our golf courses um, in the city are on recycled water. And that uh, working with the city's Bureau of Sanitation to develop um, recycled water out of the city's uh, Tillman Water Reclamation Plant and really figure out how best to get it into, uh, into our water supply. Um, stormwater capture, very important. It does occasionally rain here, and we should do everything we can to capture that uh, rain when it falls. And we have a stormwater capture master plan for the city um, that really looks at uh, projects from the sort of large scale, working with the LA County Flood Control District, uh, to really community scale and really at, down to the, to the household. Uh, so there's a lot of those projects that are uh, in the planning stage and, and underway. And then last, as I mentioned, is um, the really critical um, role that the groundwater basin and the San Fernando Valley plays, and we need to remediate the contamination there because it will help us as we try to manage recycled water, storm water, imported water when, when we get that, uh, and that we can um, really use that basin uh, not just as, at a, as it has been a small source of, of uh, groundwater, but as really a management tool. And so we're working closely with the US EPA and uh, hope to get um, to the point where we can really rely on that uh, groundwater basin for all that it, uh, all that it can provide to us. Um, but really, I think the, the most important thing um, that we can do going forward is to to really think about water in an integrated way and not to think about the rain that falls, the water that comes out of your tap, or the water that goes down your, when you flush the toilet, as different things. They're all really the same thing. And so we are working on this One Water LA plan. The mayor has set up a water cabinet uh, among the city agencies. Mark sits on that. Um, and it's really important that we that we develop and maintain this ethic of thinking about water in, a, in an integrated way. And then finally, I think uh, uh, we really also have to think about the role that technology and innovation uh, play in water going forward. And many of the techniques that uh, Professor Shamir was talking about are really um, incredibly important um, to help us to, to manage and to plan and to think about how we use um, all, all of the technology development in a, and innovation to help us manage our water better and to be able to um, provide water for Los Angeles um, for not just the next few decades, but for centuries to come. Thank you. So as you've heard, uh, definitely uh, quite a large hurdle to cross to transform the region's water infrastructure, um, which we've had for uh, many, many, many decades, and trying to make it so that we can have more self-sufficient um, water supplies and, and be relying on that. And that's, so that's, that's a big challenge for the years to come. You can imagine financing for that is going to really be a, a big challenge as well. Um, on the technical side, our next speaker is our, our own professor, uh, Yoram Cohen. 
He's a professor of chemical and, um, excuse me, of, of uh, chemical and engineering in the School of Engineering here. He's the director of the UCLA Water Technology Research Center. And uh, he's, he's one of the nation, if not one of the world's leaders, on membrane technology, um, which is absolutely critical for a wide variety of different um, types of water treatment. It's often thought of um, just for um, ocean desal desalination, but it, of course, can also be used for brackish water desalination or cleaning up um, uh, groundwater remediation for removal of nitrates and other contaminants. Um, and of course, uh, uh, for water recycling purposes from our wastewater treatment plants. Um, so he's had a, a big, big focus on this area and um, uh, really doing some commendable work um, up in the Salinas Valley providing um, water supply to um, people who aren't um, getting clean water without that effort. So with that, here's Professor Yoram Cohen. Well, I'm in a very difficult position. Everything that I wanted to say has been said. <laughs> and that's, that's what happens when you have such uh, wonderful you know, people speak ahead of you. The other is I'm between you and lunch. <laughs> so uh, we'll see what I can do. Uh, I've shortened my presentation somewhat. So I'll talk to you about perhaps things that are rosy and things that are uh, dreary to some respect. Uh, in some sense, I could have called my presentation uh, Water and Justice, or perhaps uh, Water, Justice, and Peace. Uh, because some of what I'm going to say is about the disparity in water availability and perhaps affordability. What you see in this uh, image in the figure, uh, I put uh, Israel on the, on the right and California on the left. And I always joke around and I say that uh, Israel and California uh, share uh, you know, the fortune of having uh, an abundant supply of water is just unfortunate that most of it is saline water. So uh, what I wanted to kind of move forward, what has already been said is that we have uh, an aging water infrastructure that, uh, you know, in California we get water from up north and that this is not a sustainable solution. Also, one of the things that often we, we're not saying is that there is an imbalance in the sense of where the water is and where the water that we need it. And so that will lead into what I will describe as perhaps the new paradigm of distributed uh, water systems. Another element that Mark just mentioned is that we have quite a few communities, and I believe that Uri Shamir also mentioned it, a lot of small water systems around California. And so I will tell you a little bit about that if we go to the next slide. This just shows you uh, an image or a map that shows some of the communities in California that have contaminated groundwater. We have quite a few communities that rely primarily on groundwater and contamination has been detected in you know, a large number of wells around California. In fact, there are communities that you see in here that are what we would consider or call disadvantaged communities that are mostly in the agricultural center uh, near small cities. Think about them as very small urban uh, you know, communities that do not have access to clean water. You see a well here on the right, but it's contaminated with nitrates. So what they have to do is basically right now drink bottled water, in some cases even bathe their babies with uh, bottled water. So we have to think about that as we think uh, about the overall scope of water and water supply management. I'm not going to give you a whole lecture here about uh, the theory of water supply management, but basically uh, think about it as balancing uh, your own checkbook. I know some of us have problems. I do, so I let my wife do it. Uh, but basically it means that you have to make sure that the water that you take out is uh, not greater than the amount of water that you put in or that is put in by various means. So basically, my only equation in this uh, presentation is that we have to make sure that this balance is gr uh, greater than or equal to zero, at least equal to zero, then we have some level of sustainability. We've heard about uh, shift in water resource management in here, and I'll briefly go through it because it's been described water conservation, water use efficiency. I will touch upon municipal and agricultural and industrial water within the context of water recycling and reuse, and the fact that we need to 
develop new water sources, whether it's impaired groundwater, which we've heard about uh, just a few moments ago, or stormwater capture. But often what we forget is that those water sources uh, really need a lot of effort and treatment in order to bring them to a level uh, to make them usable. And of course there is uh, the aspect of desalination which we heard about in countries like Israel, Singapore, uh, in Spain and other places that has become a very important part of our portfolio. Also here in Los Angeles there is a, a beginning trend, although uh, there is concern, concerns with the environmental issues, concern that we have with cost. So. Uh, if we think about the fact that we have water from different sources, water that is used for agriculture uh, would not be necessarily of the same quality as water that is used for industrial. In some industrial activities, you need water that is of less quality and some of much higher quality, such as in the uh, semiconductor uh, industry. There is also the issue that Right now what we do is we take water to one source, we treat it, and then we treat it as if it's the same water for everyone. So there is a cost that is involved in taking this water into a, uh, a treatment facility, treating it, sending it back to where it is used, then we take the wastewater, we pump it all the way or let it flow all the way to a treatment facility that is far away, we treat it, and then the question is where is the treated water going to be used? So I would argue that one of the things that we have to consider is that just like in the uh, smart uh, electrical grid, we have to think about a water grid, only it's going to be a much slower grid and uh, maybe not as smart, uh, but at least we have to give it you know, a, a little bit of, of modernization so we use the right water at the right place. I won't belabor going through this uh, diagram in here, but basically it's to depict the fact that uh, if you use water for agriculture, then obviously it's great to use water that is more local. If you have local water sources, even uh, in and around the city, can you utilize them? But if you utilize them, you have to do it in a sustainable way. So uh, I'll touch upon that uh, in, a, in a minute. So here I'm just showing you uh, an aerial photo of uh, one of the large water uh, treatment facilities uh, in uh, Los Angeles, the Hyperion plant. What you see is that it's very near uh, the shore, uh, an area of uh, a great real estate you know, value. I wish I had a home there. Uh, not, not where the water treatment plant is, right? <laughs> uh, but instead of. Uh, but you can see the problem is that you're sending all the water to treat it, some water is, you know, ends up in the ocean, and the task of taking this water and actually moving it around through a very complex infrastructure that also exists is, is a daunting, you know, task. So we have to figure out, you know, what to do here. So uh, in other places, such as in uh, Orange County, uh, water is municipal wastewater is treated all the way to drinking uh, water level, and that's what you see on the right. It's actually the final part of the water treatment process. This is uh, a membrane-based plant. That water is drinkable. I drank it. I'm still here. Uh, and on the left, uh, on the left, what you see is a plant that is essentially of the same components, the same size membrane, one that was built by UCLA student that has been used for both industrial water uh, uh, treatment and recycle, as well as for seawater. That little plant provides water for provides about 18,000 gallons per day. So that's roughly enough water, drinking water for 36,000 people. I wanted to show you that so you can see the scale, you know, between the two. You know, one is that uh, one serves, uh, I think, roughly around two and a half million people. That's on the right. And, and the other one, well, I was kidding around with our chancellor some years ago when we were on a on a trip where I said, uh, you know, we can take the UCLA plant and uh, produce water from the sea, we can bottle it, and uh, we can call it Ocean Spring, and uh, we can have those bottles on the table instead of, uh, I, I don't know who manufactured those, so I won't say anything. Uh, in any event, uh, so here is this little plant, and uh, what, what you may not know is that in very urban, in urban centers, there are a lot of uh, water uh, uh, cooling uh, towers that are used for industrial facilities, for hospitals, uh, even here on campus at UCLA, water that is used for chilling. And a, a portion of that has to be uh, basically discharged because there is evaporation, salinity increases, uh, more particulate matter in it. So uh, at UCLA, as an example, about 60 to uh, 
you know, over 100,000 gallons per day are discharged into the sewer. Uh, LADWP charges UCLA an arm and a leg, you know, for water. Uh, I won't tell you how much. Uh, but uh, imagine if you could recycle some of that water, even 50%, then you can save quite a bit. So in fact, this is what the UCLA team has done, and you can save uh, perhaps up to about 90,000, roughly about $100,000 a day. So if you're dumping water into the sewer, you're basically dumping dollars into the sewer. Uh, so that's one example, and there are many, many such facilities around the city. Another example is that of agricultural uh, water reuse. So the UCLA team has actually built this plant that you see. It's up in uh, Northern California right now. And what you see in here is uh, agricultural water and drainage water. You see it on the top. You see this muddy water. You see at the bottom left uh, water that is uh, green, you know, mucky. Uh, you wouldn't drink this water. But in fact, you can take this water and take it all the way to drinking level quality. So what does that have to do with urban centers? The question always is, about 75, 80% of the water in California is used for agriculture. Once you use it once or twice, you know, that water is no longer used. Uh, it's part of the cycle, you might say. But if you could take this water, treat it, you can put it back into the system, the canal that is at the top, and it's much cheaper than uh, desalting seawater. So that's another example. Now, I'll show you one at the lower scale, and this is at the residential level. So here you're looking at a system. I know it's not beautified. This is an experimental system, which is essentially uh, parallels uh, something uh, similar uh, to what has been done in Germany and also in Israel. Those are vertical wetlands. Basically, you take gray water. It, re it cycles through the plants that you see at the top, and it basically drips into a tank below. I won't go through all the, through the detail. Uh, technology here, but basically you treat uh, gray water from the home, and then you take this water, and you can actually uh, use it for irrigation, and in this particular case, it was for avocado trees, orange trees, ornamental trees, savings of about 30 to 40 percent, you know, of the uh, daily water consumption uh, in uh, a typical household. So, uh, I won't belabor the, the issue of uh, why is it difficult to implement in an urban uh, setting. You know, perhaps we can talk about that in the question period. But it's doable. We have the technology to do that. And the question is, why are we not doing it? If we would do it, we could save, in many cases, a significant amount. We do it on large scale. You heard about golf courses, right? But yet we have people that don't have clean drinking water. But they have golf courses. All right. So. Uh, I just have a couple of more slides and to say that, so what are some of the things that we need? Uh, we heard about uh, you know, smart cities and monitoring, and I'll try and distill it to something very simple. We need monitoring of both water use so that we can figure out water use patterns and water quality. Because if we don't know what the water use patterns are, how can we determine you know, where to really put our emphasis in terms of conservation and water use efficiencies? Otherwise, we're doing it blindly. That's not to say that it's not good. It's good to, to, to move forward with uh, essentially any type of conservation and any type of increasing water use efficiency, but the question is, where do we get the major return? And this is why we need to do that. In fact, if you do that, you can also determine uh, the potential uh, leakage that may occur. And uh, here at UCLA, we're actually monitoring a, a number of different communities, and we were able to see uh, when they had leaks, and that was quite simple, when we saw a tremendous amount of water used consistently uh, from about 2 to 4 o'clock in the morning, we were saying, unless those people are partying, you know, every day, you know, where is this water going through? Uh, on the other hand, when uh, there is tremendous use of water that is not called for, in other words, high quality water that is used to irrigate uh, a park, uh, water that, in fact, should be potable water that we, we have been treating, uh, that creates uh, an issue. So in any event, what we need is to, to also recognize that we need to have systems that have a smaller footprint, require less energy, so we can use it with the grid, we can use it with solar power that you heard about uh, earlier. And this will, I think, change the paradigm. But there is a difficulty in doing that because the current paradigm is that of centralized uh, systems uh, for the most part. So 
uh, what are the challenges with the conservation and uh, reuse. Conservation is great, but you have to remember there's only so much that you conserve because you need to have that water for various activities and have to be careful that conservation doesn't actually stifle uh, you know, further development or business growth. So it has to be done in a, in a very, very careful and integrated way. If you look at water reuse, one of the main problems that we have in water reuse is that legally, uh, well, at least the regulations right now, is that you cannot take uh, treated water, that is uh, municipal wastewater, and put it back into the system as potable water. In other words, there is no direct potable reuse that is allowed. So uh, in Orange County, in the large uh, uh, plant that I showed you, water is basically injected back into the ground uh, in order to recharge the aquifer, and then somewhere down the line, you pump it back up, and then you can use it uh, for uh, uh, as potable water. But you cannot put it directly into the system. There are various reasons for that. Uh, there's no reason why it can't be used, but there are technological issues. And if anyone asks a question during uh, the session, uh, then we'll do that. So with that, uh, I'm going to say uh, we need to make a significant leap forward uh, in terms of our paradigm for water management uh, so that we can uh, develop uh, this concept of uh, new water for everyone. Thank you. All right, so we'll have a, a couple seconds or so for questions before we break for, uh, break for lunch. Um, one of the things that I think you've heard from a lot of people um, that we really need to move towards is, is metering. Um, the fact that you, you pay your water bill once a month or, or once every two months, you're not really getting much of a conservation signal when you only see a bill once every two months or once a month. And so that's something that's just completely archaic that needs to change right away. Um, and then in relation to uh, what Professor Cohen was saying on indirect potable reuse, um, an exciting thing that will happen, State Water Board will put out new regulations by the end of the year on, on uh, allowing indirect potable reuse uh, commingled of treated, uh, highly treated wastewater uh, with surface water reservoirs. So that'll be the first time that'll be allowed um, within the state of California. It's something that's occurred in various places around the world. Singapore um, is probably best known for it um, for quite some time. Uh, there'll also be a feasibility uh, a report on whether or not, how you move forward with direct potable reuse and, and whether or not it actually is feasible. And if so, what sort of protections would you have to put in place um, in the event of plant upset so that you're not putting public health at risk. So. Um, a lot going on in this space in water recycling, which is very exciting. I will ask the first question, then open it up to you. Um, um, and so the, the question for Professor Shamir, um, out of curiosity, how has the construction and operation of um, the Israeli um, desalination plants um, impacted Israel's energy use as well as greenhouse gas emissions? Desalination plants or the entire water sector in Israel uses 6% to 8% of the total energy. And it's speaking with, uh, to about 8% with the advent of desalination and then going down because the rest of the economy is using more. So the total consumption of energy is not a very significant matter in terms of desalination. Uh, in the cost of desalinated water, 40% is uh, capital, 40% is energy, and 20% is all the rest, chemicals and manpower. So there is no major impact, uh, although there are. There are in terms of vulnerability, for example, to failures of one kind or another. Mm -hmm. There are issues of discharging the brine in, back into the sea, which is about twice as concentrated as the water coming out of the sea. Doesn't seem to be very significant or important. And there are other vulnerabilities associated with that. But can I ask the second question? <laughs> <laughs> to my this colleagues, on, to my the colleagues on, the, on the panel, yeah. if 70% of the water in California is being used by agriculture, that's the greatest point to go for. Thank you. No, 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 no. We want agriculture. Agriculture built this country, don't forget. They were the pioneers. They came out west. We are living here because of the pioneers in mining and in agriculture, as we are in Israel. So hang on, hang on. So <laughs> a lot of clapping. It's not wow. a matter to be taken lightly. 
But at the same time, the investment that we can have socially, legally, economically, to change the pattern of overall sectorial use in the country and in most of the other countries in the world. All of them are using 70 plus for agriculture. And we need the food. But we can do it probably better. There was a time, and I don't know whether it's still valid, where the cities in California bought water from the farmers down the Central Arizona, uh, Arizona project by lining the canals, for example, and mm -hmm. saving the losses and having that. So I think that the interaction between the different sectors is probably a major point to go to. So that's a question. What is was that question? being done? I don't think that was a question. I think that was a statement. <laughs> but the question is, why not? Well, uh, if, if, if I may just answer part of it, th this is a question that I always ask, in, in, in fact, in public forums. Uh, and, and I did that once uh, in, in a meeting of uh, DWR, you know, board of, of directors, and they basically quieted me down. <laughs> Department you of know, Water I Resources. said, well, all you need to do is say 5%, and we won't have a problem in Southern California. But I think in, in, uh, th that has a lot to do with the, with the water pricing. That has to do with the fact that water, even across, if you go through the San Joaquin Valley, different people, different farmers, different uh, uh, groups pay different amounts. Uh, they have senior rights, they have junior rights, and it's very difficult to have a unified approach. But I think that uh, the key is if, if, you can, if you can teach approaches for irrigation that will save water and yet not you know, decrease the productivity or the profitability for some of the, the, the largest uh, corporation, the farming corporations, I think it's a win-win. And I think that that's occurring slowly. Uh, for those of you who may not know, uh, Netafim, which is a, an Israeli company that deals with uh, uh, precision irrigation or drip irrigation, uh, is about 40, you know, roughly about 40% of California irrigation is in fact uh, drip irrigation, but not in that part of the agricultural sector in, in the San Joaquin Valley where we even have uh, flood irrigation, which uh, is really not the approach. So Okay, so we have... We have 10 minutes left, it, it, it's a very complicated answer. <laughs> um, and uh, one of the things that we need about f five hours or five months to discuss would be the water rights issues and how do you deal with all the various different water districts. And um, uh, to say it's complicated would be the underestimate of anything that's said today. Um, but um, one of the reasons urbans get picked on for water conservation is because they can. <laughs> um, and so it's, it's much easier to put um, a, an impact on urban use than it is on agricultural use. That doesn't mean it's right that it hasn't happened. It just that's how it is right now. All right.